So welcome to Austin, uh, Austin's number one online marketing meetup. Again, my name is David Vogelpohl. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at DavidVMC. I organize the meetup uh, with a few of the people that I work with, uh, Cecilia and Kelsey, who actually does most of the work uh, right here. So thank you, Kelsey. Um, and I want to thank Affiliate Summit for sponsoring the food and beer tonight. Now, the funny thing is they, they pretty much sponsor every meetup. Sean's got like this recurring invoice with us that he asked for, and it just pings off and pays a bunch of credit card. And that's great. The problem is Sean has missed like the last five meetups. Now, his, his grand excuses are things like his kids' soccer games and uh, his anniversary and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But he had to miss tonight. Uh, the excuse tonight was, was he was sick. So what I want to do to, to give Sean a little jab here for missing so many meetups in a row is I want to prank him. So what I would like everyone to do, if you have a Twitter account, uh, pull out your phone and go on Twitter. I'd like you to just tweet hello at affiliate tip. Affiliate T-I-P. Just say hello at affiliate tip. Don't say anything about awesome or anything else. And uh, let's confuse Sean a little bit tonight uh, since he wasn't able to make it. Um, that Twitter handle again is at affiliate tip, T I P. Um, and I'll ask him about it later, maybe in a casual way, to see if he uh, recognized it. So, um, just some reminders uh, use the hashtag be awesome if you're going to tweet in general about the event, uh, but don't use that hashtag if you tweet at Sean. Um, also use the Meetup app to check in, upload photos, and then uh, obviously thanks to Capital Factory for having us here. Um, those guys are really awesome. So, the speaker tonight, I know him well, although I haven't known him long, maybe a year. Um, he organizes the WordPress Meetup here in town. Uh, there's a bunch of sub meetups um, that are all held, organized by other folks as well. Um, but Pat organizes the Master Umbrella meetup for WordPress here. He's actively involved in the WordPress community. He's a developer, uh, and actually Pat works for me at Marketing Click. He's uh, our lead WordPress developer, and he helps people uh, create WordPress software. And tonight, what he's gonna be talking about is DIY WordPress development. Um, now what Pat does is, is hardcore programming stuff, and you're all here because you wanna know about DIY. And we've all been there, right? You're starting a new company, you don't have the money at all, or you don't have the faith in what you're building to dedicate your resources to it, and so you decide, I'm gonna do this on my own. But it doesn't work out very well. Um, and it doesn't work out very well for some very good reasons. And so what Pat's gonna do tonight is he's gonna to talk to you about how you can go about building a WordPress site on your own, what to avoid, um, and then what to do right uh, during the process. So I won't take up any more of your time explaining what he's gonna talk about. I'll let him do that himself. Um, Mr. Pat Rains. Um, I will try to project as best I can. If anybody in the back can't hear me, just yell out and uh, I'll yell louder. Uh, the little phrase on here by uh, wise carpenter is measure twice, cut once. Uh, somebody give me what you think the meaning of that generally is. It shouldn't be hard. Anybody, blur it out. Double check your work. Double check your work. Win. Woo! Oh, no, win. win. <laughs> yes, win, but also win. Yes. Uh, always. Before you, Before you take action. That's Before you take action. Yeah, because if you've already cut it, it's going to be hard to go back and measure it, put it back together. Uh, and that guiding principle really should be under every website you're trying to build. Uh, if you're just going nuts and you're trying stuff, that's great. If you're trying to use it to make money or run a business, take your time beforehand and uh, think about it, plan about it, test it, and then launch it. Because once it's out there, uh, once it's broken, it's harder to fix. So going forward with that, this is going to I'll probably repeat myself with that a bunch in here because it's it's true. Uh, I've seen countless numbers of websites. I've been hired to fix websites, I've built websites, I've broken websites, crashed websites, crashed web servers. Uh, you know, yeah, if you haven't crashed a web server every now and then, you're not doing something. Uh, but hopefully you're not doing it where you crash a client's web server. That's bad. Your own, that's cool. You can fix that because you have a backup, right? <laughs> um, so we'll start general, we'll get a little bit more specific as we go through um, and uh, go through these examples. 
uh, when we get through with this, if you have questions, you know, throw them out there and we'll see what we can do to answer them as best I can. General tips, um, hosting, really, I don't want to, hosting is hosting. I mean, you get a web server, you get an account, you get an Amazon account, you get a Rackspace account, you get a WP Engine account, HostGator. You get a web server hosting account, you've got access to the server. Generally, they're going to run Apache or Nginx. Generally, they're going to run PHP. Generally, they're going to support WordPress. Uh, they have MySQL. I mean, if something doesn't have some of these things, it's really got to be an odd situation because the software is not new. Software's been out there a while. WordPress is over 10 years old. PHP's older than that. MySQL's older than that. Apache's older than that. So hosting's hosting. You can break hosting down into big buckets. Um, managed hosting versus unmanaged hosting. If you're starting out and you want to get that uh, low cost web hosting for your small business, what might come with that low cost is you pretty much do everything yourself. Uh, so you set up the permissions issues. You set up MySQL and make sure the PHP can talk to it. You set up your server software. Pick Apache, pick Nginx, pick, pick which version of PHP. So yeah, it's cheap, it's great. But the, the flip side is you're gonna end up doing a lot of that. Uh, and how much is that time worth to you? It could make the difference between going to manage web hosting, where you're not gonna have the error messages where WordPress cannot auto-update itself. WordPress cannot save that image to the uploads directory because it can't write to it. Well, it could if you went in and set all those permissions right, but because it's unmanaged hosting, it's all on you. So there's not, there's not a wrong answer with one of these. It's just, do you have the resources to set one up and be a web, a web server administrator, or is it taken care of for you and you pay a little more for it? You know, you, you, you weigh those two. Um, the top bullet on there is kind of the general rule I've developed over the years. And it's don't put all your eggs in one basket. If your domain name is at the same place as your web hosting and something goes wrong with the web host, there's a good chance you're not gonna be able to get your domain name to point to where it needs to go. Or they, you know, it, the, their accounts get compromised. You've lost your domain name or access to your domain name and you may have lost also your hosting. So I like domain names at one place and my hosting in another place, because if my hosting provider gets compromised, I can just point my domain name to a new host. Uh, you know, you can spin up a DigitalOcean server or an Amazon web server instance in five minutes, point your domain name to it, and as fast as it propagates, your website's back up. You put them all in one spot, something happens, you, you, know, you just you run the risk of losing that. Protect stuff, use protection, uh, backups, um, vault press for WordPress websites, in my opinion, is probably the best backup solution out there because you install it, you configure it, and you don't think about it. And that's how a backup software should run. You shouldn't have to think about it. It's there and it's doing its job. Uh, with vault press, I think the medium level account, they'll scan all your backups and if there's known malware in it, you get an email. And they say, hey, we found known malware. You might want to check your site out. And here are the files that are infected. Your server gets compromised. Uh, this happened to a friend of mine. And their hosting provider was denial of service. Something went bad. A disk died. Everything on that hosting provider was gone. Well, he had Vault Press backups running. He pointed his domain name to a new host, set up default WordPress, put the Vault Press plugin in there, put his credentials in hit the button and it restored everything from the last backup. He only lost 15 minutes of time of comments. You know, none of his main content was, was lost because it was all backed up. Every time WordPress runs a post, saves a post, updates a post, saves a page, updates a plugin, anytime somebody does a search on your WordPress website, whenever WordPress cycles itself, with, if all press is running, it's gonna say, hey, what's changed? Write those changes to our backup. So you've got a good backup. And it's off site. So if your stuff's compromised, it's sitting over on a server farm that's, you know, no quadruple redundancy backup or something. You can recover stuff from that. Prior to needing a backup, if you're starting your website and you're getting in there and you're hacking the code and you're doing all that, 
Use something to track your changes. Versioning, uh, Git, SVN. Use one of those things. Even if you're just editing a pre-bought theme and you're hacking just one little file in there, you're gonna do it again. And you're gonna spend the day doing it because you're, you're gonna go down a rabbit hole of how that header should look. And you're gonna spend four hours on that. And then you're gonna think, you know, that first idea was best. Well, if you haven't tracked all your changes, that's a lot of undoes on your keyboard to do. Um, if you're using Git and you're committing your changes, you can go back, look through your commits and say, this is the one I want. Hit the button and you're, you're back to where you were. GitHub, you can host stuff up there for free. It's public though. So I think their entry level account at like seven bucks a month or something. You get two, three, four private repositories. It's another off-site hosted area. You can work on your code on your computer, save your stuff up there, and pull it down from wherever else you need to be later. Bitbucket's free. That's a pretty cool one. Uh, GitLab is like DIY GitHub. You are kind of a sucker for those things and want to run your own Git server. GitLab Community Editions, open source software for free. You can install it on the server. Maybe you know, you've got a small development team. People are in different places. You don't want to use one of the public accessible ones. Set up your own Git repository or Git server with GitLab. Backups, versioning, it's an ounce of prevention. Um, it's very tempting just to say, screw it, I'm just going to code. I'm just going to code, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And man, your system locked up and you lost your hard drive. You don't have it backed up. If you're not versioning your code somewhere, you've lost your work. You know, uh, my laptop got compromised two years ago before, before I got this one. And I had no idea, you know, I, I, luckily I had backups of everything because I was just like, I'm wiping away three months of stuff. I'm not sure what's screwed on here. I pulled the disk out, put a new disk in, pulled everything off the servers, and you know, I took a week to go through my old disk to make sure everything was clean. I've had a disk fail on me. Like literally, I'm sitting and working, I hear a click, my computer goes black. Okay, I go through the stuff you know, that Apple's support says to do, bring it back up, and all my disk does is click, 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 click. That's a total failure. <laughs> you know, backups will save your butt in that case. Yeah. Okay, PowerPoint turned those links blue. Um, at the last slide, there's a slide share link. You can download this uh, and get those links. Hardening your site. Hardening your site basically means put some systems in place to prevent or to make it harder for malicious intent to damage your website. People who are just gonna screw around and jack with people's websites. You can do a few things to make it harder. WordPress has done too well, they've done one thing and really, really well that I like is that when, that when you create a new instance of WordPress, the default username of admin is no longer there. So you have to actually specify an admin username. That first link is for a plugin called Four Strong Passwords. If you have a hosting account with WP Engine, that's installed by default. You can't turn it off. When you set your password and that little strength indicator starts going across, if it's not strong, redo your password. This plugin will make that mandatory. You have to have a strong password or, or it won't take the password attempt. The second one is called Limit Login Attempts. And it, by default, lets you fail a login attempt three times. And then it locks you out for, I think, up to 20 minutes. You can get, you, there are ways around that. Um, you can configure that some. But that just prevents somebody from slamming your site trying to try to, try to do a login. Better WP Security, it's now called iThemes Security Plugin. This is a really good one too. Uh, local developer here in town, Chris Wegman, has authored this one. Uh, it does a lot of these things. Uh, in addition to IP blacklisting, uh, changing the MySQL ID of the default, of the, of the initial admin user, um, logging uh, 404 errors, uh, blacklisting somebody after so many 404 attempts on the same URL. Um, gosh, ton, tons of stuff. Uh, uh, it's a free plugin too. So take a look at that. 
look at its default settings. Some of them you may need to tweak and adjust. Some of them, you know, you might not want to go, you know, balls to the wall and lock everything down. Uh, but it, you can use that thing and set up a pretty decent uh, security setup. The last one is simple user password generator. And what I like about this is this brings the convenience factor into all this stuff. If you're creating a new user, um, just go in, create the user, hit that button, it generates a strong password. You don't ever see it. Hit another button and it emails the information to the user. Uh, so you can just create, create a strong password on the fly right there for a new account. Themes and plugins. Simplicity is the key. Um, I think one of the most notorious themes on ThemeForce is called Aveda or Avada or something like that, and its options panel is literally about this big. That's way too much. Um, <coughs> you know, make it simple. The you know, your end user or the people who you have using your website every day shouldn't have to face an appendix of instructions on how to use your website. It should be pretty straightforward. So, you know, just try to keep it simple when it comes to these things. On the plugin side of this, you know, it's really easy just to install a new plugin and try it out. Okay, that didn't work. Deactivate it. Let's install another plugin and try it out. You know, I've two, three years ago on my dev site, I probably had four slider plugins, two SEO plugins, three breadcrumb plugins, and I just left them there. And that, that's fine as long as everything else is fine and everything else is okay. One, I mean, if you have them all turned on, you're gonna have issues there because the code's gonna probably conflict if they all try to do the same thing. Um, but, you know, keep it clean, keep it uncluttered. The more of these things you let sit in there, that's just more code that may not get updated, may be out of date. There's an unknown security flaw in one of those. There's, you know, something that could be used to do something bad on your web server. Just try to not keep a bunch of stuff in there. Clean your garbage out. Um, the tip I have on here is that there are some plugins that do a really good job of doing more than one thing. Uh, WordPress SEO and Jetpack in particular, I used to not be a fan of Jetpack because you had to create a WordPress.com account to use it, but they've done a lot of revisions under the hood there and put in things like uh, custom CSS editing so that somebody on your site can put custom CSS into a file and it's got a nice syntax highlighted editor to let you do that without touching your main theme style sheet. So you don't go in and muck with the primary style sheet, you have a separate file that gets loaded last. So the Jetpack plugin puts that in there. Uh, Jetpacks, they, they acquired ShareDaddy, the ShareDaddy plugin, and the, it's the easiest plug-in for putting your share, social sharing icons to the bottom of a post, to the top of a post, or whatever. You know, there's not all this funky code from God knows what and JavaScript stuff popping up here and there. It's just nice, simple buttons, tweak this, Facebook like, whatever. Uh, what else does it do? It does uh, 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 with conditional widgets. So you have one main sidebar. But that one widget, you only want to show up on one page. Fine, put it in your main sidebar, hit the thing that says only show on this page. So it does that. It has uh, a beautiful responsive image, image carousel that's not only beautiful and responsive, it's also retina aware. So on your high DPI screens, the images are loading at a higher resolution. All that's in one plugin. WordPress SEO, WordPress SEO does a great job managing the SEO for your content. It also does breadcrumbs. It also does social tags, it does authorship, it does uh, sitemap, XML sitemaps. Um, I think it does redirects now as, as well. All that's in one plugin. So why load up five plugins when you've got one that'll do it? The last line in there, you know, if, if you get down a road and you're really about to get this site out there and it's worth it to you, get somebody to come in and do an audit of the code that you've got. Have somebody, developer level, come in and look through things and say, you know, there's a better alternative for this. Or, yeah, there was a bug where this happened here. You know, have them, look, have them look under the hood and just make sure everything's there. It's like when you, you know, when you get a used car, have a mechanic take a look at it. Make sure everything's in there. Um, really all you need to know, sliders suck. 
Um, and that's not coming from the developer side. Those are SEO links. Business cases where the sliders added zero value to the content on the page. And as a developer, we hate well, we hate them because they've been around forever. And the return on them is just not there. And these links are to people who have done the studies, usability studies, case studies, watching people use them. They don't work. They're pretty. But is it pretty to you or is it effective for your client? Are you getting sales from it? No. Uh, one page themes have been a rage, but there's starting to be some pushback on that because they're overly simple. You, you can take simplicity way too far. I love a simple one page theme. All the contents is right there. It looks cool. Bad thing is, is how do you share content that's in the middle of that page to somebody? You can't, I mean, well, you sort of can, but when all the links are just a hashtag and then the JavaScript slides you down there, that link that you share, that you send out, uh, there was a, a, I favorited a tweet, I should have remembered the URL, where they were looking through and saying, you know, here's the search result when I try to search for this one page theme site and their contact them and it's just the one page theme URL. It's the main URL. Well, here's another place that actually has a contact page with the form and the contact info on there. And you've got descriptive search results, you've got an actual URL that makes sense. So that's, that, that there's a case, there, there's probably a case there. Um, that's why I say maybe not a good idea, but I think that's something to think about. If you're thinking, let's get one of these sexy one page scrolling themes, maybe not. See, you know, do some testing on it. Tools and tips. Um, okay, the first one in there, who has ever had to make a PDF available to people on your website? If you're on a WordPress website, throw it in the media library. It's a, it's a media file. Well, the problem there is your URL becomes this, you know, whatever slash wp-content slash 2012 slash 04 slash 05, whatever name dot PDF. The page links to plugin lets you create a page and down at the bottom say use this URL and put the URL of that PDF in there. So now you have mysite.com slash file or terms dash of that service. And it does an automatic 301 redirect to that media file. Or you have a, a survey monkey URL that's some garbage URL or some Amazon affiliate URL that's massive and about this long. Make a page with a nice, clean, friend, you know, search-friendly, user-friendly slug and have it redirect to that. This page links to plugin will do that for you. <clears throat> um, if you are redesigning your site, you've got a whole new look and feel. The old and busted theme's going away, the new hotness theme's coming in, uh, you've got massive wide images that are going to be on there now where you had images that were this big before or vice versa or are you going to sort of a pinterest grid type or waterfall type design regenerate thumbnails is a plugin that will go through all your images in your media library and resize them to the new theme specific the new image sizes that are specified in the theme in the new theme so you don't have to just redo all your images let it crawl everything in there and it'll generate these new sizes um, if you've tested lots of themes, if you've tested tons of plugins, the hidden thing you don't ever see, unless your server administrator has been screaming at you because the databases are going way too slow, a lot of themes and plugins will add options to the back end of WordPress, a checkbox, an input field, a settings box. They won't take the extra step to make sure that these options don't auto load every time the WordPress main function is cited. When you remove all these themes and plugins, a lot of those options don't go away. There are still database entries for all these options for stuff that's not there anymore. And every time somebody hits a page, does a search, whatever, all that stuff's loading into memory on your server. The options optimizer plugin, use this one with a developer if you can, unless you just, you know everything that's in there. It'll find all these orphaned options, and you can turn them off so that they don't auto-load, or you can even nuke them and delete them, um, especially after a development cycle. It's worth 
running this before you launch, just to make sure that all that stuff, those four attempts at whatever that were run through, those settings pages that you redid five times, all those old options may still be in the database. Um, start looking at code. So you've got your stuff out there, uh, view source in your browser, and some things to look for. Uh, do a find control F or whatever in your source and look for jQuery. <clears throat> and see if the jQuery JavaScript plugin, uh, not WordPress plugin, but an actual JavaScript library, see if it's loading twice or three times. Uh, see if it's loading from the Google CDN as opposed to your local instance of WordPress. Um, it should be coming from WP include slash JS slash jQuery. If it's not, that means that somewhere in your code, a plugin or a theme, the developer decided that the version of jQuery that comes with WordPress, it wasn't good enough and wanted to load from the Google CDN. Okay, well one, that's an off-site link from your web server. Why make that extra request? That's just more load time. And two, the version of jQuery that comes with WordPress, it's right there. Use it. Um, the other thing is, um, view source, look at your body tag. Do a control F for less than body, find the body tag, make sure it has class equals and then something there. If it's just a body tag, the theme developer did something wrong and left out a function that adds classes to the body page. And that's just, it's, it's, it's sloppy. Uh, every page in WordPress gets a unique body class added to it. Your designer who's doing your CSS more than likely is looking for that because that way the footer that's on the contact page is this tall versus the footer on the home page, it's this tall. Those classes aren't in the body, there's no unique hook in there for them to make those style differences. They have to do a lot more work and bill you more. Um, okay, in your theme, if you see in, in your header.php, more than likely, if you're in the header.php and you see a script source equals like this, this is old school HTML, and there's nothing wrong with this, except when it comes to a CMS, WordPress has no idea that that's there. So you've got some link to, we'll say jQuery or prototype or whatever, and now you add the uh, Gravity Forms plugin, for example, and it loads jQuery from WordPress's repository, your, your local repository. That script tag is invisible to it because it, it, it's hard-coded in the HTML. WordPress doesn't actually see that it's coming in there you're gonna have conflict. Hard-coded scripts in your theme files shouldn't be there. There are functions in WordPress that are many years old now that will load these things, and if they depend on something like jQuery or Prototype or Flexbox or Modernizer or Masonry or whatever, if those aren't loaded, they'll load them. And then if another plugin comes along and says, hey, we also need Masonry, Oh, masonry's already loaded? Okay, we're not going to load it again. You prevent memory hits, you prevent conflicts that way. So that was bad. This is good. This function, WPEQ script, that should be in your header file. The theme that comes with WordPress 2014 uses these to load CSS and to load JavaScript. Because then if another plugin comes through, Explain where people can find these files. Yes. Um, in your theme, in the header.php or in the functions.php. Where they can find the where they can find header.php files. Yes, sir. In the in, in your in your theme folder. Yeah. yeah. In your theme folder. So 2014 that comes with WordPress. It's in the WP content directory slash themes. That's the default theme. So when you get WordPress installed the first time, it's got that sort of black header bar up here, your content, black sidebar. That's kind of the template theme for people wanting to learn code. Uh, they're very well written, very well designed, and you can use them as kind of a learning tool to pick up on some of these functions. There's a website called the WordPress Codex, and it's the Wikipedia of all of these functions. So WP and Q script, WP and Q style, they, they give you examples and how to's. You can start using that, you know, copy paste and see what happens. Uh, but if you're not wanting to really, you're like, I don't want to get into this code stuff. 
but something's happening in your theme. If you see those and you don't see the script tags, that gives you one set of information you can give to whoever's working on your site. If you don't see those, and you see these script tags in your header file, in your theme, that gives you another set of information to give your developer and say, hey, this guy said these script tags in our header file may not be good. And it can narrow down what may be the problem. That's about as super technical as we're going to get on this, but it's a process, not a race. It's, there's not a finish line. And that can, you know, to people who think one way, that'll terrify. Oh crap, we're never gonna be done. Well, it's an organic thing, it keeps going. Your business doesn't just end because you open the doors. Your business is just getting started because you open the doors. You know, you build it, now you run it. Well, website's kind of the same thing. You know, WordPress is gonna change. PHP's gonna change. Web servers are gonna change. You know? Who knew we were doing websites on these things? Who knew we had these things? 10 years ago. Uh, you know, they were Motorola flip phones. StarTac. <laughs> you know, StarTac rocked. But you're not going to browse the web on StarTac. Uh, so, you know, it's going to change. So, take your time. Go slow. Measure twice, cut once. That type of thing. Any questions? A couple questions. Uh, one related to the other, uh, sure. which is so you had mentioned. Um, not to install quite a few plugins, but you have listed like 15 of them. So, which ones would we use? And then, what do you consider, as, as you know, when you do too many plugins, that slows down server time for a load time? What's a good load time? Or what would you want it to be? Ideally, right? You can track it in like Google Webmaster Tools and stuff. But is three seconds good? Is two seconds good? Because it, all it says is, hey, you're doing faster than 80% of your websites or 20%. How do you kind of gauge that? By looking at load time on, on the plugins that you have. Well, you know, multiple instances running it through tests on different connections and things like that. I think the average is around three. If you're over three, you should take a look at things. Uh, eight seconds is like a you know, warning or something wrong. A lot of those plugins that I mentioned in there, like the uh, options optimizer, you wouldn't leave that on your site when you launch your site. Oh, that's a cleanup one. Okay. I generate thumbnails, I wouldn't leave that on a production site because that's regenerating all the thumbnails that I need. Uh, once my theme's in and I've got all my images I've set, that plugin is going to come out because that's not a day to day plugin. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, the Query Monitor plugin I didn't put up there because it's really more of a hardcore dev tool. I would not run that on a production site because if I'm logged in as a WordPress user, I'm seeing all these query stats come in there. That's loading in my page. So okay. I don't want that sitting out there. Okay. Um, if I've got a membership based site and people are logging in, I don't want all this stuff loading in there for logging users. I just want them to get what they need to get, because okay. it should be quick. Yeah. Okay, great, nice. yeah, thank you. Um, now, uh, so kind of related to what you said, you know, the, the questions come up all the time. How many plugins is too many? There's not a solid answer for that. I know a guy who's a top developer, his membership-based sites load 27 plugins. Now he's audited every single one of them and made sure that they work right. Some of them he wrote, some of them he's used from third party, some of them are paid plugins that he's bought. But he's got 27 plugins loading on his production site. Not all plugins are the same. Right. Thank you. Yes, you were talking about he validated the plugin. He audited the plugin. He audited the plugin. So I'm guessing he's using the WordPress plugin directory information rule header up there. How, how would how would people use that to that really good, That's the other really good question that comes up after how many plugins is to me? How do I find the good ones? Um, the plugin repository at WordPress.org has been the last two years undergoing a lot of changes and a lot of review of everything that's in there. They now tell you when the last time that plugin was updated. That's a factor in determining what's good. Uh, you can see the number of reviews and the type, you know, the level of reviews. That's another factor. The link to the support threads about that plugin are there on the WordPress.org website. Browse that, you know, first two pages of that to see how many, oh my god, this crashed my site reports are on there versus I really don't know what I'm doing with this plugin. All of those factors are going to play into determining what's a good plugin uh, and also what you need it for. Will determine whether it's a good plugin or not. Because you know, 
WP Touch may be a great mobile site plugin, but if you're wanting a responsive website, that's not the plugin I would use. Because it literally loads a whole new looking feel for your site as opposed to a responsive website. So there's a use case conflict there versus a bad plugin. Any others? Do you find yourself uh, using plugins that are not on the WP plugin directory? Or are they all there that must be on the Yes, I do use some. Uh, Gravity Forms is not on there because it's a paid plugin. Uh, but it, when it comes to form, it's, it's my hands down favorite one. Like, I mean, I, you pay for it. It's a, it's a paid plugin, hosted somewhere else. WordPress, the WordPress repository for all the free plugins. Well, the, the known good free plugins that are out there. You can find plugins all over GitHub. Just know where you're getting it from. Uh, other ones, other examples. Other than little, little bitty one-off ones that I've written. No, I mean, I, if, I, if I have to use a plugin, more often than not, it's gonna be on the WordPress.org repository. If it was on there and it got taken down, then there may be a reason for that. Uh, but that's only happened a few times that I know of. Does so anything about the um, WordPress on the hosts, the VPN engine, and so? I thought, I'm sorry, say that again? The WordPress specific hosts with like the WP engine? Sure. Um, I've got sites on WP engine, and I like it. Um, Pagely's been a good. WordPress only host, uh, Synthesis has been one as well. Um, GoDaddy has managed WordPress hosting now. I mean, uh, there's a there's a demand for it. I do think, you know, you're going to do your homework. Um, if you, this is where the measuring twice comes in. Think about what you're wanting to do with your site. If it turns out that you're running apps as part of your website on the same domain, you may have to consider either your own box, uh, a managed VPS maybe, or a workaround if you're gonna stay with a managed WordPress only host. Um, by apps, do you mean other non-WordPress websites? Apps, yes, by non-WordPress functions. Uh, I'm trying to think, you've got a... New Relic. I'm sorry? New Relic. Yeah, New Relic, New, new Relic based uh, pages and things like that, or some uh, directory, you know, custom built directory app tool that sits on the web server. It's not in within WordPress. It might send data to your WordPress pages, but it's not in a WordPress environment. So it's not part of that, which means it's running in its own directory outside of WordPress. Managed WordPress only hosting may not support something like that. Uh, it, you know, it, it just depends on the case. That, that, that answer? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, um, what do you recommend as far as for managing subscribers or plug-in or for that? Like what? If you wanted to have subscriber people that can have uh, different, you know, access to different parts of the site through username and password. Like members only content? Yeah, like S2 okay. members or something. Is there anything better than that? Or uh, it, better is not the word I would say. I mean, th there, are, there are good cases to be made for S2, there are good cases to be made not for, depending on how granular you want to get with your access control. Um, is it paid? Does it drip out to them? Things like that. If you're looking just for uh, kind of members only, the members plugin is a really good one where you say this page only members at this level can see it. Done. And anybody who subscribes to your site, you set up the settings so that they're automatically into that level. Uh, but if you go beyond that, then you're going to look at something more complex like wishlist member or S2 or. Oh, there's another one. There's a digital newer one. access pass. I'm sorry? Digital access pass. Digital access pass? I haven't heard of that one. I'm trying to think of the one that Pippin wrote. Um, so member Mouse, too. Member Mouse is a good one. That, I've heard good things about that one, too. Buddy Press. Buddy Press, you can do members only content, um, although it's more of a. This is our social, you know, sort of, sort of a garden. This is our, this is our playground kind of thing. Uh, integrated with WordPress very well since it's also managed by Automatic, but it's not so much a paid content kind of thing. Uh, 
Uh, but you can say your buddy press group X, these pages are years and years only. Uh, so you can do that. That help? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so along those lines, what have been some plugins that you have discovered that may not have when you first downloaded them, but now cause issues, errors that we should avoid recently uh, discovered that come to mind? I wouldn't know where to start on that. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, question is what plugins have been working great but now cause problems? That's a shifting target because you may have a plugin like Next Gen Gallery that you know, oh my god, now it's broken, the new version of WordPress caused it to break, or tiny, uh, what's the tiny MCE plugin that lets you enhance the buttons in the WYSIWYG. WordPress 3.8, I think it was, <clears throat> redid every one of those buttons. They completely changed how the buttons in the WYSIWYG work. So the tiny MCE plugin that's out there, it had, if you didn't upgrade it, you were in, in trouble. But what happens is, within a short period of time of that version of WordPress happening or that conflict becoming known, it's fixed. A new release comes out, all is well. I just have one more question. Um, yeah. Do you recommend updating the themes or the version of WordPress? Like if your site is running at full optimization speed and everything's great, should you just leave it alone and not update it or jack it up? Okay, so this kind of relates to your question about the managed WordPress only hosting. <laughs> And why I still have sites on WP Engine and love them is because their staging environment makes that not a problem. So I have my production site, and then I can hit a button, and it copies my entire production site to a staging subdomain. I can do whatever I want in there, and my production site just keeps on going. So I can test that. Hey, big, huge change in WordPress, 4.0. Well, you know, a, a, a top number release is a huge deal. Test the crap out of that before you put it on your production site. So, a, a separate instance that I can do everything like that is where I would do all that. I would spend my time doing that. I would work that into my production schedule. We're looking at the new version of WordPress. Would I hit the button as soon as it came out? No. Not at all. No. Uh, on my laptop? Yeah. I'm going to do it. It breaks. Bam. Hit the button. You know? Because then, I mean, I'm a developer, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be running betas of this stuff before it comes out so that I can sort of try to stay ahead of the game. Because your good plugin authors and your good theme authors, the minute the new version of WordPress comes out, they're releasing updates that day, or within a day or two of that. Because they've been working with betas and release candidates, following the discussion threads, and the whole crap, look out, this is gonna cause problems. They're ahead of all that. But yeah, the live site, no. I've heard rumors Amazon pushes out changes five to 20 times an hour or a day, something ridiculous. You know, I'll go to Amazon and the front page changed three times in a week. And, you know, they, they're testing new stuff all the time. That's Amazon. You know, I, I, I'm proud of what I do, but I'm not Amazon. <laughs> what about managed WP for keeping up with stuff like that? Managed WP for keeping up for stuff like that. Uh, managed WP, which is sort of a remote management tool. Uh, you can manage multiple websites from a dashboard. It's great for applying those updates across multiple sites, but you're still gonna to have to test everything when you have new releases of things coming out. And you're gonna to wanna to test that in a way that doesn't bring your live site down. But once you know what you're doing, if it's just a matter of updating five plugins, you verify that nothing's gonna happen, and you have multiple sites, something like Managed WP is really good for that. Because you just say, update plugins, update plugins, update plugins, update plugins. And it goes and does it. Where are you um, setting the staging site? Well, if you're on a managed host like WP Engine, they have the staging instance ready for you. Uh, if you're not on a managed host like that, say you're on a, you're on Amazon server or DigitalOcean box or something, Rackspace Cloud, you'll have to set up either a subdirectory. I wouldn't recommend a subdirectory. I would recommend a separate web server because if you have to make changes that involve touching the web server software and your dev site is on the same environment as the live site, you can't just update the PHP INI and reboot the web server. You're rebooting everything at that point. Uh, so you want to do it on a separate, separate setup somehow. 
So on what? top of that, though, that, that, that WP Engine is doing now, he's right, the staging is super easy and extraordinarily convenient on WP Engine. But about a month ago, they had it now where you can just do a single button copy per site, and it just pushes over the site to a new copy. I mean, you can't bring it back like we can have the staging environment. That's a beautiful way to just make a complete copy of your site, you know, in a throwaway environment. You know, not turn on a bit and then, you know, purge it with, with literally just push buttons and it. Yeah, they've, they've really enhanced the, the MyWP Engine dashboard a lot. I've, 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 there's some parts on there I still have to go in and get familiar with because I've never been able to it. So what is the link to the slideshow? Because there were some slides. Thank you. We'll post the link on the meetup as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they were white. <laughs> uh, modern time slancha. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. What a language. Gaelic. I got a shame. So we talked about a lot of plugins. Um, which would you say are your absolute core? You never build a website without. Doesn't matter what it is. Okay. The top. You don't do anything without installing these first. You see, I need five. Um, regenerate thumbnails. I have a, my own custom little plugin that writes custom post types uh, and short codes. Um, gravity forms. Advanced custom fields. Um, I didn't really mention that because. While the plugin's great for building the back end and all your custom fields, you still have to do the custom work in your theme to get all that data to show up. Um, so that's what four. Um, WP Migrate DB Pro. That's what I use for pushing a database from my dev site to my live site. What is it called? WP Migrate DB Pro. WP Migrate DB Pro. Because if you're developing on one site, your URLs are all different. If you push the database to the next side. If you just export the database in MySQL and you go to your new one, you put it in there, all your URLs are still where the old site was. This plugin, you put it on both and you say, pull the database from here or push the database to here. It changes all the URLs, all the paths, reload your destination site, and it's all there. It literally clones everything. Not the files, just the database. Files are easy, I can push those over. SFTP or something, but the database, that's, that's one where you always have to go in and you used to do all the MySQL commands and change all the URLs that way. This does it all for you. So those are those are the five I use on everything that I've built. Um, running a site, let me see if I can give you some that I would run a site with. Gravity Forms again, because of all the forms and the power that's behind that. Page Links too, because those terms of service PDFs and stuff like that, survey links, I want a clean link. It's my domain. Um, did WordPress SEO. It's the only SEO plugin that I've used uh, for all of my sitemaps and stuff like that. Um, Jetpack. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention on Jetpack is if you want people to subscribe to your content updates when you put, post new stuff or when comments come out, Jetpack has a subscription form built in. So if you've got an active community, commenter community or things like that, you want people to be, you know, get notices and email whenever you post new content, Jetpack will do all that for you. Um, uh, I don't have a favorite analytics plugin, but either the WordPress, uh, Google Analytics for WordPress, or there was another one, right? Google Analyticator. Although I think it's dying out, I'm not sure. Not Google Analytics. Not that one. Okay, that one then is dying out. Exactly. The the Yoast, Use the Yoast one. The yeah. Yoast WordPress uh, Google Analytics plugin. So those are five plugins that would be on the site that I run, as opposed to developing sites. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, There's uh, plenty of beer and food, and uh, have fun at network. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Thank you.